he appointed me to be in charge of a research project in the department after finishing my course. After a year, by then I moved and, and taught social work in various institutes. In the year 2015, again I have been invited to serve in the department of social work. I am a very simple village boy. I born in a very small hamlet. I studied uh, my course, my schooling, everything in Tamil medium. I came to department. The department has been developed in me under the leadership of Dr. William Sambal. So, because of that, in the light of this particular historical background, I am the first graduate of my Hamlet, first international student of my Hamlet, I became to be in the department of social work, Madras Christian College, because of the able leadership of Dr. Miriam Samuel and other professors, Dr. Prince Sanare and Dr. Prince Solomon. Without, without that, their mentorship, I may not achieve this status. So I want to give back to this department by choosing a person, uh, choosing me to be a teacher in the de department. So, to honor the, a great woman who empower others, at this juncture, honoring fathers and the contributions done by the friends of Jonathan Callaghan, who passed away while raising funds for the extension programs of the college. His death surpassed his friends to establish the Jonathan Callaghan Memorial Center for the Integrated Rural Development Studies, where the PG diploma course in rural development was conducted. This later evolved into the Department of Social Work, offering medical and psychiatric and community development social work programs with the help of Professor Nayan John. So, Jonathan Carrigan sacrificed his life. Professor Nayan John, able to bring out the department, his sketches and inputs to you. We need more macro practitioners. Introduction is the key to various insights. Now, I would like to invite our distinguished speaker for today's endowment lecture. Ladies and gentlemen, it is with great pleasure that I introduce to our esteemed chief guest, Dr. Lance Cobb, Department Chair Social Work, School of Social Work, California State University, San Bernardino. Dr. Lansfong is a distinguished scholar whose research dwells into an intricate way human service organizations respond to change, particularly focusing on adapting service to meet the need of new immediate populations. With over a decade of professional experience working with federal, state, and local governments in human services, Planning and evaluation, Dr. Lance spoke of knowledge and insight to her work. Her passion, understanding, and dynamics of human service provision is evident in her dedication to exploring the role of university community collaboration in supporting the work of human service provider. Dr. Lance spoke academic journey includes earning a PhD social work from the University of Illinois at Urbana Cabin, completed by a Master's in Public Administration from the George Washington University and a Bachelor in Political Science at Urbana Campbell. Her research and technique interests span a broad spectrum includes human service organization and administration, human service work with immediate clients, macro social work practice, and immigration and social welfare policy. Dr. Lamsburg expertise in qualitative human service research further enriches her contribution to the field. Please join me in extending a warm welcome to Dr. Lance Cobb, whose dedication in advancing in, so in knowledge and fostering collaboration in the realm of social service is truly com commendable. Thank you. Thank you so much, Benjamin. The reason we are here is here. Yes, it's Dr. William Samuel. Now, I would like to invite Dr. William Samuel, a of department, to felicitate our guest and to hand over the session. Thank 
you, Margaret. I was quite happy that uh, I was being left out for once and I just wanted to relax and sit back and listen to the lecture. But I think they decided not to spare me. Uh, good morning to everybody and a warm welcome uh, once again to uh, faculty, students from our own department, other departments, family members, and very specially our guest for uh, today. Uh, I'm so happy that uh, this initiative with the California State University USA has begun and uh, we really look forward as Prince Anagarai said for years of collaboration with the university. We had started international programs in a very small way in 2000 starting with the University of South Australia and then building our connections with various universities across the globe including the USA. And over the years, we have almost about 10 MOUs that we have signed, and quite a few of them are very, very active. Of course, post-COVID, we've been struggling to get some of them onto the feet again, and COVID did take a toll on these international exchanges, but we find that picking up now, and we started working again, we've already had some exchanges in place, and we have students to you know, see uh, also. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you again to the department, uh, Dr. Deirdre, and we're so happy that you are here. I was listening to the introduction by uh, Mr. Benjamin and looking at the vast knowledge that you have. I'm sure we'll have a very, very fruitful collaborations in the years to come. At the Department of Social Work, our collaborations have always been student-centric. And being from the social work background, we have really looked at how it can be and benefit from these collaborations. I really look forward to seeing students from your university and students from our department of social work to be able to go on exchange and faculty members to be able to come to share the expertise, resources, collaborative research and collaborative publications in the years to come. I think one of the areas that we really can focus on that can really uh, spearhead the collaboration is collaborative research because we really can build in faculty time, we can build in uh, student researchers and publications and this is one way in which to really kickstart the collaborations. I'm also very indebted to the department and very specially to Dr. Uh, Sudarshan for instituting this endowment in my name. I do not know whether I deserve it, but uh, he brought this up and when he said it, I was quite uh, uh, taken aback and also uh, very touched by the respect that he has for me. And therefore, I thank you, Dr. Sudarshan, for really instituting this endowment in my name. And we had the first, we are having the first lecture today. I know it was a little rushed, but we did not want to miss the opportunity of having you speak to us today. And therefore, we said that we must have this endowment. Thank you so much, ma'am. Without any further delay, please join me to put your hands to welcome our Dr. Lannis to challenge in insights. so much. Thank you. It is an absolute pleasure to be here today, to be back in India, to be back in Chennai, and to be with you here at your university. I'd like to start off before, uh, before my presentation of thanking Dr. Samuel and telling you that before I knew about MCC, before I ever dreamed of coming to visit here, I knew your name and I knew your work. And it is somewhat like seeing a rock star to be in the classroom with Dr. Samuel. It is an incredible honor for me to be here with you today to celebrate your farewell from MCC and to give this lecture. Thank you. It is an honor. I'd like to especially thank all of you students here this morning. I understand that you have quite a busy week. You have a party to plan for tomorrow. You have dancing to practice and singing to practice. You have exams to prepare for. And so I so appreciate you being here. I'm excited for you. I'd like to begin my talk today um, first with 
with telling you a little bit about me and about the university that I work for and about the students at my university. I think that um, when you finally get the chance to meet, you will really enjoy each other's company. You have a lot in common. You definitely have the same passion for social justice, for social change, and for your communities, and the communities that you serve. I appreciate greatly that the challenges of technology are the same around the world, <laughs> right? I'm thinking of every time I had to give a presentation in class, right, and I couldn't get it to come up on the screen as a student. But first I'll tell you a little bit about me. Um, I come from the middle of the United States in a very rural community of about 200 people, a farming village. What would even be a small village, I think, by comparison here. Um, the community that I came from was mostly agricultural. There were not very many opportunities outside of agriculture for this, the children that I grew up with. And my parents really insisted that I go away to college, that it was the only option, that it was the plan for me, because there were so few opportunities in my hometown. I'm wondering if many of you or the clients that you serve can relate to that experience. I went away to a university that had 40,000 students. It was a huge culture shock. It was scary. I felt like I didn't belong. Maybe I wasn't smart enough to be there some days. I see some nods, you can relate. Yeah. So for me, college was a way out. And in my maybe second or third year of college, I had one of those wonderful professors. I think you probably can relate to this as well. I had one professor who took an interest in me, who made an effort to get to know me, to understand my strengths, maybe to help work a little bit on my limitations, and who suggested to me that I should apply for something called study away. So study abroad was not a, um, it was, a, it was available to me, but it was not accessible to me at that time. The idea of studying in another country seemed completely out of reach, economically, socially, um, from, any, from any standpoint. But the idea of studying away in another city, in another place, with another group of people was a possibility. And so my professor, uh, Professor Frederick Wirt, um, may he rest in peace, suggested that I try. And he told me that he would help me. And so in the summer between my junior and senior year of college, I moved to Washington, D.C., this capital of our nation, and I worked at the U.S. Treasury Department doing uh, financial analysis. Um, there's no relationship there to social work. Probably the most important thing I learned on that internship was that financial policy was not for me, right? But literally, I worked in a building in my window. Let's see, is there a little light? My window overlooked the U.S. White House where the president works. So I went from this small town where we grow corn, fields of corn as far as the eye can see, and that was right here in the middle of the country, to an office with a window overlooking the White House. There were a few days when I saw the president's dog playing in the White House yard while I was at work. It was surreal. It was surreal. But it was also really powerful, because in addition to the work that I was doing, the experience that I was having at my work, I was among 200 other students doing the same thing, who had come from different backgrounds across the United States, who had different goals, different dreams, um, different challenges, different strengths. We worked together that whole summer. And I learned from those students and from the people I worked with in my office that a different life was possible that different paths were possible, and that a different reality was possible, both for me and for my home community, which was struggling greatly and which continues to struggle greatly. After that, I pursued a career not in finance. Probably I have some regrets about that. It would have been more lucrative. But I pursued a career in macro practice. 
I've worked in federal, state, and local government agencies, um, in research, in policy analysis, in human services planning, and in lobbying and political action. Actually, I didn't go back to get a PhD until I was in my late 30s. So being a professor is a relatively uh, recent career change for me. And I think it's important to recognize that change is possible at any age. Now I'd like to tell you a little bit about the university I work for and the students there, who are wonderful. California State University is where the red dot is here. It's in Southern California. It is about 75 miles east of LA and Hollywood. What do you think of when you think of LA and Hollywood? Tell me what you know. Go ahead, tell me. What do you think of when you think of Los Angeles and Hollywood? Los Angeles, 75 miles from Hollywood, within a one hour drive. And yet we are a world away. A world away. The community that I live and work in, which is right here at the base of this mountain range, it looks quite beautiful in this picture. But if you were to visit up close, you would see that it is one of the poorest regions in Southern California. Southern California is a land of great extremes. We have both the richest celebrities in the world the richest political leaders, the richest business leaders in the world, and we have the poorest of the poorest communities. And I live and work among one of the poorest communities in Southern California, just an hour away. 80% of my students are the first in their family to attend college. Most are from immigrant families, many from Mexico and Central and South America, but also from Asia, also from Eastern Europe, also from Africa and the Middle East. It is truly the representative of the American melting pot that we, we talk about, where people come together from all corners of the world in this small, underserved region. Over half of my students live in poverty. At any given time, 10% of them are homeless. We have 20,000 students at our university, so 10%, 2,000 students being homeless at any given time. It's quite a lot. And yet my students are the most committed of any students I've had the privilege of, treat, of teaching to serve their communities. They are committed to change, they are committed to changing the world, and they are committed to changing their worlds. And I'm imagining, imagining that you can relate to that. So I'd like to tell you a little bit about the benefits of study abroad as we know them from the literature. The literature, the research has some very clear um, outcomes related to, to study abroad. Um, student trans transformation and growth. It turns out that when you study abroad and travel, you, you grow as a person, right? You transform, you mature, you develop. Your eyes are opened, which is a great thing. Definitely there's research that suggests that the cultural connections, the humility, the cultural appreciation that students develop when they study abroad sticks with them, personally and professionally. It enables them to partner with people they may not have otherwise been able to work with in the past. It allows students to develop personal and professional relationships, really meaningful relationships. And definitely, students develop increased self-awareness and insight. They also seem able to identify some contrast in systems between their home society and their cultures, the societies that they visit. All of these things are wonderful. All these things are wonderful. And I brought you some pictures to show you a little bit about our study abroad programs that we have. This picture up at the top is a group of our students and faculty visiting the country of Pan to the Panama Canal, um, 
So they're visiting Panama. This image right here is a group of our students, including myself, visiting um, an Indian reservation. So um, in the United States, we also have tribal communities, but they are very often relegated to specific plots of land. Usually the land is very undesirable and remote. And so we visit it regularly. Once a year, we visit this reservation. It's called the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation. It is in the state of South Dakota in the central United States. And uh, you can see behind me, we are building uh, what's called an outhouse or maybe latrine for families who do not have indoor plumbing facilities. And then this third picture right here is also a picture of uh, a visit students made to an indigenous society in Panama. We also have a study abroad program to Italy. Um, it's a very different program as you might imagine. Uh, there's a, all the pictures that come back from the trip to Italy show food in them. I think that that is their focus, cultural exchange, a little bit of social work, a lot of eating. <laughs> but there's something missing in the literature, and I think it's really important. In the literature on study abroad, there's, there's, there's very little focus on macro practice. The focus is mostly on person-to-person -person interaction, person-to-community interaction, uh, maybe some micro work, some meso work, understanding how to be in a different society, how to, how to hold yourself when you're working with clients from different cultures, from different backgrounds. But what's missing is the macro focus, and I think that's a missed opportunity. Global well-being varies it, across countries, around the world. It varies due to geography, economics, culture, but also due to policy and administration. The ways that countries differ, the way that social problems differ, the ways we address them, those are choices that we make. They're not just things that happen to be. They're, they aren't organic. They're policy decisions. And by looking at how a country has chosen to respond to a particular social welfare issue, we can adapt and identify pieces that might work for our own context. I've got some examples of this. On Tuesday, a number of your classmates took me on a tour through uh, agencies locally where internship placements were held. And, um, it got my mind racing the whole time. I was, I was thinking about what's different about this? How is this different from my own context? What would this kind of service provision look like in my context? And why is it so very different? And it really got me questioning choices that we make. And study abroad is really an excellent opportunity to identify what those choices were, who made them, and whether they're the right choices for our country, our community, our clients. So here's the first example I have. One of these pictures maybe looks familiar to you. Um, and this did not happen on our agency tour, but I've been doing some of my own visiting in my time here. Um, so I was visiting the um, Marina Beach area, and uh, I had a tour guide with me. And we were talking about fishing and fishing villages. And I asked about this, this very large apartment complex near the fishing village. Probably most of you have been there or seen it, right? Yeah? Okay. This would never happen in the United States. There is nothing like this in the United States. I cannot think of any area of Oceanside beachfront property that would be developed into apartments like this. It is so unusual. My husband is traveling with me. He and I both stopped and stood and looked at it for about 20 minutes. It's so out of place. Do you know why? This is what Oceanside property looks like in California. Maybe this is Sylvester Stallone's home. Could be. I don't know. There are no apartments on the beach in California. None. In fact, there are some places where you have to struggle to find access to the beach because it's the property adjacent to the beach is all privately owned and developed into mansions. Yeah. So the idea that a community would decide to place 
what's called, we would call public housing, I think you'd probably call it government housing. Government housing here next to the beach so that the people who work fishing here could live close by to their profession is unheard of. It simply would never happen. We got to thinking on our drive back from Marina Beach, where do the fishermen live in California? We don't think they could afford to live within 10 miles of the beach. I never thought of this before. Where do the fishermen who feed my family, who bring the fish, who we buy at the store, where do they live? I don't know. But I can tell you they do not live by the beach. Here's the other example. I, visited, I first visited Chennai in 2012, and the, most of the trip, the tour guides and the people we were with were talking about the metro. Metro building was really in, um, uh, ramped up. It was going strong in 2012, and I can see the results of that right now. When we came in 2012, there were lots of places where the metro tracks were just partially built, and now there are trains running over them. And I want you to know that there's very little public transportation in, in Los Angeles. This is what a typical workday looks like. These are all cars, individual cars. Most of them have only one person in them. There's a special lane over here on the left if you have two people in it. You can be in the fast lane if you have more than two people. But this is what traffic looks like in Los Angeles. Public transit is nearly inaccessible. There are trains, there are buses, None of my students can take a train or a bus to campus. They have to come to campus via a private car. There is a train that runs by my house. It does not take me to my campus. I could not take it. We are a nation, we are a state, we are a city, we are a nation of car drivers. Car drivers. The implications of this is that sometimes we could be in, in the traffic just to go, I don't know, 20 kilometers we could be in traffic for two hours or three hours. It's so congested. The greatest demand for the School of Social Work at the moment is to develop uh, more online seats in our MSW program for people who either don't have a car and therefore cannot get to campus, or who simply cannot afford the two or three hour commute back and forth to campus because they have other responsibilities. It's changing everything for the United States. It's changing even our educational system, the fact that we don't have reliable public transit. And when I moved to California and I asked about this, well, why, why can't we have it? Why, why can't we build a train? Why can't we build a light rail? Why can't we build these things? The answer is, well, it's too late now. The city has already grown. The city's already developed. We already have six million people. You have quite a few more, and I see the building continues. So you prove that theory wrong, that it can't be done. It can be done. It's a policy choice. Just like the housing on the beach, it's a policy choice. My third example is the most embarrassing example of all. When I came in 2012, there was plastic everywhere. It was visible. And I remember this. It was visible in shops. It was visible in stores. It was visible on the street. It was visible everywhere. There was plastic trash everywhere. And I remember this distinctly because when I visited Chennai in 2012, I also visited Bangladesh. And Bangladesh banned plastic bags in the early 2000s, and there was not a plastic anything in sight. Sure, there was trash, there was food waste, but there was no plastic, and the difference was striking. It was striking. Come to learn, I, I got on the internet yesterday, and come to learn, you've banned single-use plastic, but only since 2019. Barely five years, is that correct? It's very, fairly recently, and yet it's made a tremendous difference. Do you notice? Maybe you're too young to notice, maybe. It's remarkable. And yet, in the United States, banning plastic is a conversation we can't even have. We can't even begin the conversation. California, which is the most progressive of the states, it's the best of the states, I have to say. Uh, California, in 2018, discussed a ban on plastic straws, just plastic straws, no other kind of plastic. 
and the debate raged. It caused arguments in restaurants and um, heated debates that were covered even by CNN, our national news organization, worldwide news organization, just about plastic straws. In fact, our governor at the time backed down and said, instead of banning plastic straws, we'll just ban giving them out. You can only have one if you request one. That's how difficult that conversation has become. It's, it's so important, it makes such a difference. Our world depends on it. Our future depends on reducing microplastics around the world. And yet, you have made this progress, and my country struggles with it. We struggle with it so much that you can imagine my shock and embarrassment when I arrived on, when Tuesday I vis made visits to villages, to service organizations. And all of my gifts came in plastic bags. It was horrible. It was horrible. We don't even think about it. And yet you've done it. It's remarkable. You sit here and look at me like I'm, like it's no big deal, but it is remarkable. It is amazing. It is one of the most exciting developments across the world. The idea that you would ban plastic and your country would follow along. So I gave you a few very lighthearted examples, but now I want to talk about some deeper examples. Deeper examples. I want to talk about mental health treatment follow-up. So as I was visiting institutions um, with all of you, with some of your fellow classmates on Tuesday, I had an appointment um, at the Sri Ramachandra Hospital Psychiatric Unit. Thank you, Misha, for taking me there. It was an excellent visit, but it got me thinking, and I was thinking for probably two hours after this visit about something that happened while I was there. Um, we talked about how the psychiatric unit follows up with patients who miss appointments, who don't come back. Uh, we know this is uh, very common, right? Folks with mental illness do well for a while, maybe they stop taking their meds, maybe something happens, they go home with their family, something goes wrong, and they stop coming back for their appointments. And we all know that that's a sign of a problem, right? We know that that's a sign. The supervisor that we spoke to at the hospital said that, well, if that happens, I would send a student to the patient's home to check on them. Why wouldn't I? She said it like it was no big deal. And it occurred to me that in the United States, social workers do not do home visits. We would never go to a patient's home unless it was with the police to investigate abuse. Never. We would never. It could be there's a little bit of this traffic issue. That could be. I was thinking, why is this? Why don't we go? Could be this. Could be this. If you had to drive in this, you might have second thoughts about visiting a patient's home. But I don't think it's just that. I think part of it is an overall general approach in the United States um, that says, you must come to us for services. Whoever you are, you must come to us for services. We're not going to you. And isn't that the exact opposite of what social work is about? Social work began in the United States, at least, with home visits, with friendly visitors. And yet here we are. We know something is wrong. We know something's happened. You've not come in for your follow-up appointments. We might call you, maybe. Probably not. Less than 50% chance the social worker will call you. Nearly 100% chance the social worker will send you a bill for the appointment you missed. How ethical is that? It's horrible. It's horrible. So it got me thinking, why? Why aren't we out in the community? Why are we sitting in a treatment room? behind a computer likely. Why? Why is that? What's happened in our profession in the United States that there's so much distance between us and the people and the communities we serve? Again, I would tell you, policy decision. 
That's a macro practice decision. That's an administration decision. And the last example I have for you today is about care for, care for homeless, mentally ill people. So on Tuesday, I visited Rehoboth, a home for the mentally disabled. Um, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with this, but thank you to Karthik and Dina for taking me. Um, they had a great, uh, great internship experience there from what I can tell. This home serves women who are mentally disabled and destitute. They have nowhere else to go. We also in California have homeless, mentally disabled women and men, probably more men than women. At any given time, we have 200,000 homeless people in California, most of whom live in Southern California, because there's no danger of freezing to death in Southern California. In Northern California, the temperatures can get quite cold. So homeless folks, for obvious reasons, congregate in places where they can remain alive, which is in Southern California. Most of the homeless in Southern California live in what are called tent cities. So these are makeshift areas on the side of expressways, in parks, in vacant lots, where they congregate together for safety, for community, for support, for social interaction, for commerce. Here's an example of a tent city right here. And this made me wonder, why do we have this? It comes back to this. U.S. social welfare policy is vehemently anti-institution. We don't like to serve clients in institutions. Um, I was talking with a student at the hospital and she asked about orphanages in the United States. We don't have orphanages. We are so anti-institution that we've closed down most of our institutions with one exception, prisons. We have the largest prison system in the world we incarcerate the most people per capita of anywhere in the world, and yet we have no institutions for social welfare, no residential institutions, very few of them, very, very few of them. And it made me wonder, why is this better? Why are we okay with this? I visited a home, granted it was bare bones, it had limited resources, it's a difficult proposition to run a home for people who have nothing, right? They bring very little with them materially, but they have community, they have support, they have food, they have rehabilitation, they have a place. That place, Rehoboth would be completely rejected in the United States, completely. My students would never have visited a place anywhere like it, and yet, None of my students would be surprised by this. Most have a community like this on their way to class. Most down the street. Why are we okay with that as a country? It made me question. So study abroad for me, just in this one week trip to Chennai, has helped clarify policy decisions. And these are choices that we all can make. How are policy contexts different or the same? Well, poverty looks different in our two countries. It looks very different. There are some different issues. We have different economies. We have different educational systems. We have different class and race systems. Um, there are different challenges that people face that keep them in poverty. But on some level, we share this experience of deep social injustice, deeply ingrained, deep poverty, and why are the policy contexts the same or different? There's nothing about geography, there's nothing about our culture, really, that says we have to respond to a social problem in a certain way. The choices that we've made. The people at Rehoboth have chosen to create an institutional environment where women can be supportive, where they can be cared for, where they can be nurtured, where they can be part of a social community. In the United States, we have chosen hands-off approach. You create your own community. It is not my responsibility. That's a choice. 
And it's made me wonder what policies in one context might actually work, might be adaptable in another. I'll tell you, if I were to go back to my students tomorrow and say we need to ban plastics, they would say, no, it's impossible. It can't be done. It can't be done. They would all be on board. We would look at the research, we'd maybe do a study, maybe do a survey. There would be some group project presentations. They would be on board. They would be excited. But at the end of the day, they would say, no, it can't be done. I haven't seen it done. Not until they've come here. I might say for them, what would an institution like look like if you were going to create a nonprofit, an NGO organization for homeless people? What could that look like? They would never envision Rehoboth, not even remotely. They would envision very likely outreach to tent communities, a van that drives out, again the driving, we're big on the driving, a van that drives out to the tent communities and visits people one by one. But the idea that we would completely reject that model and say, no, we need a place, we need a home, we need a community, probably wouldn't enter their minds until they came here. And I am certain that in a half hour visit to Rehoboth, their minds would be changed, they would be opened. In thinking about having students come here to study abroad, to be partnered with you, to go out with you on your internship placements, I've been trying to anticipate what challenges might occur. And one thing that occurred to me yesterday is that many of my students have never ridden on public transportation. You would have to teach them how to do that. Is that shocking to you? It would be a surprise. The idea that you could go anywhere you needed to go in a city, regardless of whether you have a car or money for gas or someone to drive you, oh, it must be so freeing. It must be so liberating. No, you don't think that? It's just part of your day. You want a car. No. Yeah. No. I think they would be really shocked, but I think, they would, I think it would also open their mind to the ideas if they have this in India, why can't I have it? Why can't my community create this? Why can't we create a bus system that gets us from the places we live to the places that we work? From the places we live to the places we go to school? It's not impossible, you've done it. So that's been my experience here this week. It has been delightful, it has been eye-opening, it has been thought-provoking. I look forward to sending my students here to learn from you. I'm guessing that whatever I've experienced this week, they will experience times 100 with you. I'm also excited about the opportunities to have you come and visit the United States, to visit Southern California. We will certainly take you to the celebrity spots. <laughs> Most of our time is not spent there, though. We'd be glad to take you for a visit. But what would be really exciting is to have you come and look and see, what are we doing well? What could we expand upon? What could grow? What suggestions do you have for how we might handle something differently? I think our shared experiences would generate some really exciting solutions, some innovative, creative, exciting solutions for problems that plague the entire world, not just our two countries. And I look forward to working with all of you. Thank you. Do you have questions? You're such a very polite group. I just want you to know that uh, American students would have interrupted 10 times already. <laughs> session was really enlightening and uh, you were telling that you were telling that there is no institutionalized care for uh, people in the US but uh, and uh, and you told them that they have to make their own communities to sustain themselves so is there any people to help them because here in India uh, for instance if you take you know uh, different people like government has 
many broader flows in 1995 when it was amended in 2016. And there are certain rules to guide the practice. And there are a lot of schemes and policies with, uh, which gives the financial assistance in month, in a, in every month, with, which gives them the share. So likewise, like, what are the policies and schemes in the US which helps people like, uh, who are disadvantaged? That's a really good question. And I probably overstated a little bit. There are some institutions, especially for specific populations. For example, if you are a, an adult with a developmental disability like Down syndrome or cerebral palsy, there are institutional facilities where adults could live. Um, some of them are even integrated into community settings. Um, that would be one example. But for example, if you are mentally ill, the, there are very few institutions available for more than a very short term stay, unless you are psychotic. If you are a danger to society, you can be in a locked institution, but the standard for proving that is very, very high, and only a small, tiny fraction qualify uh, for that type of care. I call it care, but it's really a form of incarceration. Um, we don't have long-term care facilities for mentally ill youth, for adults, for seniors, with very few of them. It's really up to the family to figure out a solution. There are some what are called uh, group homes. So there might be a small home that maybe you could get a bed in. These are few and far between. But again, this might be a home with just four people or five people and a caregiver. It's not an institution, per se. So no NGOs or a uh, charity organization does this? No, it's really, um, it's considered, um, deinstitutionalization was a theme of social welfare in the United States during the 1960s and the 1970s. So we did have very large problematic institutions up to that time. And so in the 60s and 70s, when the deinstitutionalization process happened, uh, all of those facilities were closed down and the care was supposed to be moved into the community. So it was, the idea was that you would stay in your community and get services and that the government would pay for them. But very much, maybe you can understand this, government pro promises don't always result in the kind of services we'd like to see. Did I answer your question? Yes. The other ex exemption would be for um, older adults without disabilities or without mental illness. We do have quite a lot of institutions for older adults. Thank you, ma'am. The session was really great. And the question I have is, like, uh, you talked about plastic, like, the amount. So, so, uh, like uh, the amount of recycling and the behavior of individuals in managing waste, how is it in your country, comparing with India? That's a good question. It's terrible. It's terrible. Uh, we are a disposable society. So plastic is um, like the air that we breathe. Um, people use plastic nonstop. Recycling is available in many large cities, but most parts of culturally recycling is not a, it's not a common practice in outside of urban areas. Um, I think our government has also struggled with what to do with recycled plastics. We have more of it than we could ever use to make into goods or materials. So I think there's a, um, a reasonable expectation that a lot of what we recycle in the United States actually ends up in the trash. And much of our trash is shipped off to other countries. It's a pretty dire situation. Do the people litter waste around plastics? Do they litter or waste? Um, there's a lot. I would say there's a, uh, culturally, we have a anti-littering culture. Um, this was a campaign in the 1960s and 70s I want to say it was Lady Bird Johnson, the wife of President Johnson, who's well before my time, just so you know. Um, her campaign as a first lady was anti-littering. And for some reason, that really stuck. People really embraced it. So we do have a culture of anti-littering. People throw their plastics away. 
put their plastics in the recycling bin, uh, but it's still there, it's just hidden from view. We kind of don't think about it because it's in the bin. You're all laughing about the plastics. Who's going to tell me about this? Um, this research topic is based on uh, plastic, so... Uh, yeah. Littering and... Yeah. And is it more controversial here than I'm imagining? Mm. <laughs> Not really, because I have seen the behavior of people throwing waste around. So, because people, those who really manage the waste, they will feel and stress or get angry towards people, those who just live around. So that's what Yeah, so there was a campaign when I was a child in the early 70s about anti-littering. It was essentially a campaign to encourage children to shame adults who litter. And I remember being part of that as a child. It really stuck that it was our power as children to, hey, don't throw that away. <laughs> you know, uh, it's a funny thing, but it really, it really became part of our culture. Uh, so you mentioned that. Uh, you mentioned that in California, it's in a community uh, that we would. The community people are uh, living far away from the sea. Uh, uh, so how do they able to access the livelihood thing? I, I don't know the answer. Uh, I'll have to I'll have to examine that when I get home. I don't know the answer. Um, but this is true of a lot of our food systems in the United States. The people who grow the food or who do the work or whatever or whatever the work is, the low wage work. Um, and fishing would be low-wage work in the United States, tend to live very far from their jobs. So the people who do the hardest work for the lowest pay um, experience the largest transportation costs as well. I'm sorry, I don't know the answer to that, but I will find out. <laughs> Hello. You shared a few examples that is practiced in India, but that is not in U.S. Can you share a few things that is well practiced in U.S. but not in India? Just the observation you made. Hmm. Hmm. Social welfare practice or day-to-day -day practice? Social welfare practice. Social welfare practice. Um, That's a good question. You've stumped me. <laughs> oh, yes. I was talking with, uh, with students who were talking about the dress code. And they were mentioning that women students wear... Uh, oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. I've entered into dangerous territory. They, they mentioned that women students are required to wear a sari when they go to their internship. And this is something we really struggle with in the United States of whether to dress um, better than our clients or whether to dress as our clients dress. And depending on the social service practitioner, you would get very different responses. It would also vary by regions of the country. But I would say we are much more likely to dress like our clients rather than to dress more formally. These people, yeah. So the clients are wearing saris? So mostly, you know, mostly. Especially in Tamil Nadu. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a problem for us too. We really struggle with it. And no matter what decision we make, our students are unhappy. Some of them would like to dress very professionally better than the clients. Some of them would like to dress like the clients. Um, it depends. And it really varies by setting too. In a hospital setting, um, I would say students are required to dress much more professionally.
Yeah, this is a challenge in the United States as well. I think um, we have taken an approach that I don't agree with as a profession. Our approach has been to become more mental health focused and to go the route of becoming a therapist. And so trying to approximate being a, a medical professional, which gains much respect in the United States, I'm assuming here as well. Um, so that's been the, the, the way that we have handled this issue. Um, and it's a real problem. Um, what's happening right now in the United States is there's such a, a dearth of not enough doctors, not enough psychiatrists, not enough psychotherapists uh, trained in the psychology tradition that the health systems are really desperate for mental health providers. And so that's created an opportunity for many of our students to go the route of mental health practitioner, micro practitioner, become licensed, gain that credential, um, but with that credential, with that licensing credential and that experience, the pay also increases exponentially. So it's a, it's a difficult, it's difficult to turn down. Most uh, students who graduate and go into their therapy services make more money than I do their first year on the job. Um, in contrast, the students who go into community development, into macro practice, the pay is, you know, two thirds of what a therapist will make, or one third of what a therapist will make. So we're really struggling. We've been struggling with that same challenge. Um, the problem I see with that, and it's again, I'm a macro practitioner, is that when we only focus on treating the problems, the symptoms, how where will the change come from? We'll just keep creating more and more clients for us to serve in therapy unless we address those root causes. And that they potentially see uh, social work in India like more still or I, I think it has tremendous potential because you're entering this phase of tremendous growth and change. You're an emerging world leader. We're a declining world leader. You, you have incredible opportunity to see just the change in Chennai in 12 years is remarkable. It's remarkable. It's your community. Maybe you don't notice it. You just go to work, go to school, do your job. But it's just so exciting and the thing that really excites me is that you have this community development focus that you haven't lost sense of that as the world is changing and demand for mental health services is increasing if you can maintain both both become a macro practitioner and a micro practitioner i think you are incredibly powerful have a chance to change the world states of the India, like Tamil Nadu, Kerala, Andhra Pradesh, even the poorest of the poor, you know, they can get the best uh, medical services in the state-run hospitals. Mm -hmm. uh, but the situation in uh, USA will be a good uh, learning opportunity to see from your lens, my students. So, in the United States, the number one cause of bankruptcy, um, Bankruptcy is a term here. The number one cause of bankruptcy in the United States, and we have huge amounts of bankruptcy, uh, bankruptcy is medical debt. So we, we, we joke, but not really, in the United States that we're all just one major illness or accident away from bankruptcy. Um, in the United States, uh, health insurance is tied to your job. And so if you have a good job, you likely have very good health insurance and can attend a private hospital uh, we have public and private hospitals. Um, the, the cost to attend them may be relatively similar, but if you have good insurance, most of that cost is going to be paid for. Not all. Um, if you have a major health incident, you can still owe tens of thousands of dollars, um, especially for mental health care. It's covered up to a certain point. You have 
90 days or 120 days to get better, to get over your schizophrenia. And then after that, you'll have to pay out of pocket. Um, it's really absurd. Um, but I think for the poorest of the poor, we have what's called Medicaid, which is government insurance. Um, this insurance can, in theory, be used at any hospital facility, but what happens is that many hospitals won't take it, or they'll reserve only a few spots for Medicaid patients and uh, prefer to see private insurance patients. So you might have that Medicaid card if you're, um, if you're living below the poverty line or near the poverty line, you'd have that Medicaid card, but you might have to search far and wide to find a provider who has who will take the card and who has appointments available in a reasonable time frame. If you can't find anyone, even if you have that Medicaid card, your best option is the emergency department. And so we find that our emergency departments across most communities are clogged with people who really aren't having an emergency. They just need health care, but the emergency department is their only way to access it. And so that's been a major push of social work as well. Uh, to address this issue with only minimal um, change. Um, we, we do have some hope in the United States, we tend to uh, give our best social welfare services to veterans first. So if we trace historically the roots of social welfare or social support programs in the United States, um, the most successful started in serving veterans. And so, uh, we do have a robust veterans health care services program across the country, and there is some hope that at some point that will become the norm for everyone. Uh, but it's really a problem we don't, we don't have a good solution for at the moment. It's very difficult if you don't have money and if you don't have connections to get access to affordable, sustainable, consistent health care. Related to that question, how do the Native Americans, Afro-Americans, Hispanics, and even other marginalized people, they have this access to this uh, Medicare, Medicaid, uh, you know, how do they manage this that we in the task of uh, this cost, medical cost? Mm -hmm. Well, a lot of times they go without care. They go without care, they put off treatment, they put off uh, doctor's visits, they put off aches and pains, and so by the time they're seen in the emergency department, problems that could have been handled relatively easily with a prescription or with a visit to a general practitioner have now become major problems that require hospitalization. So it's really an expensive proposition in addition to being a, a poor for individuals' well-being. Um, we do have a number of private hospitals that offer what's called indigent care. So they'll, um, in order to maintain their nonprofit status, some of our most lucrative hospitals are required to donate some of their earnings to care for the poor. Um, and so that is one option um, that sometimes happens, especially we have large networks of Catholic hospitals that engage in that type of practice. Uh, it's hit or miss. Often religious hospitals are some of the main providers of the poor, which then puts a strain on those hospitals as well. If you're offering services to the poor, especially good quality services, you're very likely to be inundated. Did I answer your question? So I guess that's a major difference between here and the United States. And I heard about that um, on one of my previous visits here. We were visiting a clinic, a very rural clinic, and we asked the doctors, the students asked the doctors how much it costs to, to have an appointment or how much it costs to get medicine, and they couldn't answer the question. They just couldn't figure out what we were asking. But I guess that's not always a thing you don't always have to pay. It's really kind of inhumane. It is inhumane. Uh, regarding the farmers protest in California, so how, how social workers are employed or they put it to the duty of uh, when the protest, uh, when, uh, when there is a community problem like this or protest like this, how do, you, how do they employ the social workers there and what are the roles of the social worker? 
Mm, that's a really good question. And I would say that that's one of the roles of social work that has been emerging after a very long time of not being part of social workers' roles at all. Um, we have had a number of, of protests recently where we as a school have encouraged our students to, to engage, to protest, and we find that it's something neither they nor their parents ever participated in. Um, except in farm worker communities. Farm worker communities are very accustomed to protesting. Farm worker uh, children and youth are especially uh, um, gifted and willing to engage in activism, which is really exciting. It's really exciting. And they tend to lead our social work school. Whenever there's a protest, I know that the children of farm workers are going to be uh, organizing an event, making signs, they're going to be at the lead at whatever, they're going to be holding the bullhorn at the event. Um, that's been something positive. But again, if the majority of your work is sitting behind a desk providing therapy uh, to one-on-one -on -one individuals, you're really far removed from that role, um, which is so important. That's a good question. What's the role of social workers here in protests? Facilitating is the very facilitating, not for the protest, but how to conduct a protest without any violence, how genuine it could be, uh, connecting them with the government officials. That would be the main role that they need to be The ways that they could uh, make it better, mm -hmm. just not the protest, but to bring out the actual problem and find the solution to it, how to be facilitated to solve it. listening a long time you've been a wonderful audience um, uh, thank you for your presentation uh, so when I was an exchange student with the uh, youth and one of the issues that was very new to me that I noticed there was this issue called uh, gentrification. And I just want to know, is that something that's also happening in uh, California and the community that you work with? Because when we visited Detroit, we saw this whole issue happening. So I want to know, uh, is that something happening in California? And how are the students of your university uh, put, uh, uh, of, uh, how are your students involved in it? And what kind of interventions are given for this issue? Oh, that's a great question. Yes, California is probably this, the epicenter of gentrification in the United States. Um, the demand, especially for uh, huge, magnificent housing, is just um, out of control. And yes, I would say many of our communities are under threat of gentrification. Um, in the, the area immediately surrounding our university, um, I would say the university is part of the issue there in that the university students are actually sometimes more privileged than the people living immediately around the university. And so on the one hand, we're building housing to house our students so that they don't have to drive in their cars so far. They can be close on campus and develop a sense of community. But on the flip side, we're taking away housing then by building those student housing from the community. So it's it's a real problem on many levels. Um, housing in California is a huge problem. It's just a huge problem. Uh, some of it is gentrification. A lot of it is just the price of housing. And that just increases. Um, and you have to go further and further out away from the city in order to be able to afford the housing. But then the jobs are in the city. And I think maybe you have some of that here as well. Yeah. We were noticing, um, I don't have a good answer for how students are involved in that. Um, I think that's an area where we definitely could grow. Are, are you involved in that in some ways? Not in gentrification. But yeah, in Detroit you could definitely see that. And, you, and you've got to understand there are many people in the U.S. who view gentrification as a good thing. Very good. You know, things look better. We're, we're really obsessed with how things look in the United States, and so gentrification tends to make things look nicer, even if it's not any better for the community or for the people who live there. Yeah. Uh, one thing I noticed when I was out driving this past week were all the buses taking workers 
from the city to factories. And I think that that's something that doesn't happen in the United States either, that idea that the company would be responsible for transportation. That would probably help them in sleep. A lot of that gentrification is people trying to find a way to live in a nice community that's closer to work. And so a lot of it is driven by that transportation issue. starting to stir like maybe you have lunch plans. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. It's been a it's been an honor. Thank you. Thank you so much mom for sharing your knowledge and enriching our mind. Just understand about the benefits of study abroad, especially about macro-focused uh, study abroad and also sharing about policy differences in various aspects like uh, housing policy, everything. And it was a nice comparison and we, we got enlightened through the comparison you made here. Uh, it was really enlightening for us and uh, also thank you so much for patiently answering all our questions. Thank you so much, ma'am. Okay, I found that your faces are looking very dull. Not for the lunch time, ma'am, but Solomon sir uh, is telling that uh, they are very dull because this endowment lecture is going to end. So that's why they are looking very dull. <laughs> but we come to the end of the endowment lecture without any further delay. Now I call upon Miss Sandra Mary Jose student convener of endowment lecture to express a collective gratitude and appreciation. Good afternoon everyone, esteemed guests, faculty members, students and our chief guest Dr. Diyarji Nanisko. As we conclude the first session of Dr. Miriam Samuel endowment lecture on social work study abroad as macro practice learning, our hearts are filled with immense gratitude and reverence. First and foremost, I offer my deepest thanks to God Almighty for his blessings and guidance throughout this event. We are truly honored to have Dr. Vyadre Ranisko with us today, an eminent figure in the field of social work. Your insights, expertise, and passion for macro practice learning have enlightened us all, providing a deep understanding of transformative power of international experiences in social work education. On behalf of the entire social work department, I extend my heartfelt gratitude to each one of you for gracing us with your presence today at this lecture. Last but not least, we thank Miriam, Miriam Samuelman for her invaluable contribution to the field of social work and for creating opportunities that enrich our academic and professional journey. I also extend my sincere gratitude to all my faculty members and my dear friends who work behind the scenes to ensure the smooth execution of this event. Once again, thank you for all your presence, participation, and unwavering support. Let us carry forward the spirit of gratitude, collaboration, and service as we strive to make a meaningful difference in the world. Thank you, and have a wonderful evening. Thank you so much, Ms. Sandra. In conclusion, let us carry forward the knowledge and inspiration gained from today's discussion as we continue our journey of learning and growth in the field of social work. Thank you all for your participation and engagement. A final part of this end of I think girls are waiting eagerly, not only for girls, it's also for the, all the gentlemen. I request everyone to join for the group photo. Oh, in the game.